Hey, it's Carl Cruza. Today, I'm joined with MMA legend, Mr. Boss Rudin. Boss, what's going on, man? How are you doing? Doing great, doing great. The heat wave is gone, so I'm very happy. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So yeah. I just want to touch upon you a little bit, something you did very well, mixed martial arts, something you're very passionate in. First of all, how exactly did you get your start into MMA? In MMA, uh, well, I was a Thai boxer. I was bullied as a kid. That, that, that left, pushed me to, to start uh, because I had a bad, bad skin disease and severe asthma. Pushed me to, after watching a Bruce Lee movie, realize, wait a minute, if I'm like that, I can beat him up. Two years later, my parents allowed me to train, knocked out my first bully. Bullying stopped. Then when I was 20, I moved out of the house. Immediately started doing karate, Thai boxing, competing in Thai boxing. And then many years further, suddenly Chris Dolman, I was... Um, was at a show somewhere. Who is, he's the godfather from MMA in, in, in Holland. And he stopped me and he says, hey, man, because I, I was doing a show there with a lot of backflips and acrobatics and fight show, martial arts fighting show, choreographed fight scene. And he said, dude, you're, I see you're so athletic and I remember you from Thai boxing. Did you ever think about free fighting? You know, was free fighting. And he explained to me the rules. You could choke people, beat them up. And I said, okay, wait, but are they paying? And they say, yeah, they pay. I go, well, sign me up. I would love to try that. And then many months later, I get a phone call from him. I had to go to Amsterdam, which is like a two, two and a half hour drive from me, where I live, uh, for a tryout. Apparently, there were some two Japanese guys there who were scouting for talent for a new organization called Pangrace. And I went to the tryout. I got in a scuffle with one of his champions from Chris Dolman, and I knocked him out. Uh, and with a high kick, so that looked great, and, and that was it. They, these guys were pointing at me, and they said they wanted me uh, to fight for them. And I think within three months, I was in Japan. It was September 21st, 1993. It was my first fight in Japan, and boom, suddenly I was on the road. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so I've talked to a bunch of different fighters, and one thing I love to ask them is uh, their first couple of fights, if they have any crazy fight stories. By any chance, by back then, uh, I mean, things are a little different than there is now. Did you have weigh-ins by any chance? Were you, they tell you you're going to fight someone and you end up fighting somebody else? Do you have any crazy stories? Well, my first thing, you have to understand, I'm, first of all, I'm from Holland. I've never been on a plane. We drive everywhere. Like going to Paris, that's a four-hour car ride from where I live in Holland. So we're in Paris. You know, eight hours with Spain. <laughs> it's a completely different country. So now 13 hours going to Japan. And then, like you said, there was no weigh-in the day before the fight, which I thought was odd. Uh, but, you know, I'm fighting a Japanese guy. They're known for their being honest. So I think I will be fine. So the next day when I'm arriving, this tall Japanese guy walks up to me, shakes my head and says, oh, hey, nice meeting you. I say, you're the promoter. He goes, no, I'm fighting you tonight. I go, you're fighting me tonight. I go, what's your weight? He goes, 235. What is yours? I go, 197. <laughs> and then the promoter walked up and he said, uh, I said, is he not too heavy? And he goes, no, 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 there's no weight classes, Mr. Ruth, and everybody fights everybody. I go, okay, great, great. So I'm forcing a smile, and I said, okay, just before you go, how many minutes are we fighting? And he, of how many rounds are we fighting? And he goes, one round, and I'm all happy. I said, how many minutes? And he says, 30. It was a half an hour fight. <laughs> so I'm looking at my manager, and I go like, shit, I'm fighting a guy who's 37 pounds heavier, 38 pounds heavier than me, in a 30-minute fight, no breaks. It was uh, really freaky, but... You know, I paid, it, it went really well. That was not a freaky thing. I knocked him out really fast because he was taller than me. He's like 6'4", so I palm strike him. He went down. There was eight counts in Pancras. So he got up, and his hands, of course, were up. So I fully liver kicked him, bring the hands down. Right away, I palmed him again. And when he went down, I kneed him in the face. And it was a little bit too hard. Uh, spent two days in the hospital. Didn't wake up. It was a very scary time um, because, you know, I, I told my wife already. I said, if he's not going to come out, yeah, I don't want to do this. He was a very nice guy before the fight, you know, so I didn't want that. But thankfully, he came out. I actually became a good friend of mine. But the thing was, um, the next day on the street, people bowing at me, like one every 10 person. I go, what's going on? And then I saw the newspaper article. What I didn't notice that when I knocked him out, I was so happy. So I jumped in the splits to all the corners of the ring. But I didn't even remember me doing that. Uh, and the, the, the picture of the, of the newspaper was me hanging in the air in the splits with my opponent knocked out below me. And you could see my face. So I go, ah, okay, so this is how these people recognize me. So, yeah, it was crazy. That's uh, like, but older, I always talk about it. There's people like 70, 80 years old. They will come up to you when they saw the fight. And they're very interested, you know. You have whole conversation. If you're on the subway, most of the time it's the older people, like over 70 years of age. They come over, or you know, or you sit next to them, and they start talking. Hey, you're a fighter, right? And, and they know everything about fighting. It's uh, 
it's pretty cool. Now let's move a little bit uh, through your Pancreas career. Uh, let's talk about your second fight against Funaki. Obviously, you wanted to go in there. You wanted to avenge uh, him giving you your first professional loss. Um, I heard a little something before the fight. He kind of got into your face a little bit. Uh, going into that fight, were you determined to win? Like, were the nerves there? Were you uh, with the mindset, I'm coming out of here knocking this guy out? I, you know, I, I was a completely different fighter this time. Like, my first loss it was against him. That was my third fight ever. And then when I had a rematch, this is years later. Now I'm a completely different animal. Now I started submitting people. Uh, you know, now I knew the ground game. So my game plan for that fight was I was going to let 15 minutes pass because it was a title fight. It was 30 minutes. Uh, in the beginning, every fight was 30 minutes, but they, they steered away from it. They made the normal, normal fights 20 minutes and the title fights 30 minutes. <laughs> Um, but he never fought more than four, 15 minutes. And I always tried to do certain things to just throw him off. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to defend myself. I'm not even going to try to knock him out. I'm not going to go for something. I'm just going to slip everything through. I'm just going to hold him off until they announce 15 minutes pass. Because they will do this every five, five minutes. Five minutes pass, 10 minutes pass, 15 minutes pass. Because that, if he hears that, he's going to realize that I'm the first person who went over 50 minutes with him. Maybe he's going to do something to his equilibrium, whatever. So, I might do something. Uh, but then uh, before the fight, it started with that he walked up to me. That's what you were alluding to. He, and and he st I, I never got it. I think it was to get in the people's heads. But he slid his throat in front of me, like standing right here. So now I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill this guy. You know, I was hard at at the time. So I, I told my manager, I said, I'm going to kill him. And he goes, you got to be re relaxed. I said, don't worry about it. I'll be relaxed. But you watch. If I tag this guy, I'm going to destroy him. You know, I was so angry. Why would he do that? You know, and the fight started and, you know, 10 minutes was passed. And there was a moment that I was sitting on my knee and, uh, and he stood up and then he kicked me in my face. I blocked it, but it was an illegal kick. Officially, you cannot do that. So my game plan went out the window. 10 seconds later, I drop him with the first punch because I got angry. And that's when the onslaught started. And, and, and that's when, well, they, they say it's his best fight he ever had. And they say it's my best fight that I had because this guy showed so much heart. I mean, my, my palms were black and blue. I had bruises on my knees from kneeing in the face. Both cheekbones were broke, his nose was flat. I mean, I went to town on this guy. And every time when he, I thought he was down and the whole audience started chanting, Funaki, Funaki, and he got up, he wipes his blood off and he's screaming at the audience and he fights again. I go, shit, I got goosebumps now. It was so wild, it was so wild. And then the final knee, I knocked him down three times. And then the final, I just grabbed him by the hair as hard as I could. And I just kneed him in the face as hard as I could. And that was it. That, that's when he stayed down. But uh, it, it was pretty interesting. I was really getting tired at the end there because I was hitting him so hard and every time he got back up, it was crazy. Now let's switch over to Pride. You know, Pride, one of the most historic MMA promotions. And I think guys like you and Mauro Ronaldo have really helped with that. Really, um, I guess, give some of the mystique to it and the storytelling to it by doing great commentary work. How exactly did you end up going over there and doing commentary for them? Well, I had Mark Kerr as a student, um, and Mark Kerr was the man at that moment. And I remember in 2000, early 2000, I believe it was, they, um, we were sitting in the dressing room, and Mark Kerr is the main event, and there was a fight going on. I believe it was the fight also. The first fight started, and I said, oh, uh oh, he's going to get him in an armbar. And there's people from the uh, from Pride Fighting Championships were sitting with us in the dressing room. And he goes, what do you mean? He's, he's not going for an armbar at all. I said, give him five seconds. And I'll be, oh, see, there it is. And they go like, how did you see that? I said, well, you can see the setup, but what he's working on. Yeah, but he was not even in the position to do it. I said, well, the submission guy can see that. I just saw it. And then the next fight, I believe it was um, Carlos Newton versus Sakuraba. And I remember Sakuraba sitting on his all fours and Carlos sitting behind him. And I go right away. I say, oh, he's got to watch out. He's going to roll him into a knee bar because that was Sakuraba's specialty. And then again, they said, but he's, how can he pull a knee bar from there? And at the moment they said it, he rolled in and he got him in a knee bar and he won the fight. So that was them they, telling me, say, hey, listen, I, did you ever think about commentating? So what do you mean? I said, well, next, next month we have the Pride Tournament. That was the one that uh, Mark Coleman won. And uh, we're going to broadcast it to pay-per-view uh, to the United States. And we need a broadcaster. We would love you to be the color guy. And I say, sure. You know, I would love to do it. And I was so green. I always tell people this. I had no clue you had to wear a suit. Don't ask me why. I had no clue. So I was literally there in my flip-flops, in my shorts. I thought we were going to just be the voice. I didn't know we opened the show and all that. I never paid attention to that stuff. Who cares? 
right? I'm just talking about the fight. It's not like I had to do all my memorization like the play-by-play -play guy has to do. So I arrived there with my, with my flower shirt <laughs> and they asked me where the suit was. They started laughing when I said, what suit? And they thought I made a joke. <laughs> and he goes, are you serious? I go, yeah, nobody told me to bring a suit. I have no clue. So now we had to come up with something new. So what happened was Stephen Quattro's at the time, he was the commentator with me. He was in the arena and he was talking about the fight and then he would throw it to me in the back. I was sitting there with my flower shirt with six geishas around me telling war stories. You know, at one time I fought these 11 guys that are eating grapes, you know. So this way is how we dealt with that we had a problem, you know. So then later on they didn't see me after the opening anymore because I was just sitting behind the commentating booth. But that caught fire. Suddenly people loved that intro. So now we had to start doing that every single time. We start making these little openings from the show. I thought it was hilarious, you know. It, it, it's too bad to suddenly we, uh, we got a bad seat coming in, a new producer who had no clue what he was doing, and he cut everything out. I go, it's stupid. I, I think it's really great because people were always looking forward to a little skit in the opening uh, of Pride Fighting Championship. But he said, no, no, everything needs to be exactly the same. We couldn't say, for instance, you couldn't say he's 3-0, and uh, 3-0. and zero. I couldn't say – because – Normally I say, okay, if somebody is 3-0, you say that, or 4-0. But if somebody is like 25-0, uh, and 0, I say 25-0, and 0, because 0 pronounces more that it's absolutely nothing than 0, you know. But no, 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 you couldn't say uh, 0 anymore. You have to say 0. Oh, and we have to be like every other organization. And uh, I thought it took the fun out, unfortunately. And now a rumor that I've always heard with Pride is when you guys came in and you started doing the first English broadcast uh, in 2000 for that tournament, did you guys have to go back and record over tape the previous events before that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first, no, I think one till ten or something. We did, uh, we did here the studio here. Yeah. And how was that? Was that kind of weird being able to do have to do that? Go back on fights you've already seen before and had to do the commentary over it? Yeah. No, no, no. It is because it, it, what you, whatever you do not want to do is start watching those fights before you go to the commentating because otherwise you you. You start saying, oh, he should do this, you know, so thankfully for me, you know, I didn't remember all of these crazy fights anymore because you know, otherwise you give yourself away, you have to really watch out for that. Now, what do you think was so special about Pride? You know, Pride put 90,000 people into a stadium, something the UFC, no combat organization has done that since. What made it? What, what gave them that pull? It is, you know, it's Sakuraba. Sakuraba, the guy beating five Gracies. Was unheard of at the time. Think about that. Nobody had done that, and then he just did it. So the, he put it on the map. That poor guy. I mean, he got banged up, and they put him against Vanderlei, and two fights later, get back against Vanderlei. Go, do, do, do. This is the guy who made fights. You want to maybe, you know, give him a few fights in between so he can recoup from the freaking onslaught he had two fights ago. You know, it's a shame. But then all these fights, like Mirko Krokov and Fedor Emelianenko and Nogueira brothers, and, but everybody, I mean, these guys were just insane. I remember uh, the first time when uh, Dana White came uh, for the Pride. He brought Chuck Liddell with because Chuck was going to compete in the, in the tournament, in the light heavyweight tournament. And I remember the opening of the show started and I'm looking back to just see his reaction. He's literally sitting with his mouth open. It's like in this, and he catches my eye. I go, crazy, right? He goes, whoa, this is crazy. It was such a cool show. And unfortunately, a lot of people here in America, we wouldn't see the packages that they had over in, the, in, the, in Japan. They had these really great little movies, you know, about Krokop and about Fedor, you know, and he, like Krokop and Fedor, that piece, dude, I hope you can find it on... Um, on, on, on YouTube, because that, what they did, you, you saw Krokop trading in his high-tech gym. Everything is clean, freaking hat kicking the bag, bang, bang, bang. And then you go to Russia, and he's running in the snow. And it's with, with frozen kettlebell, although with a rusty kettlebell swinging. You know, and you go back to Krokop on the machines, more like Ivan Drago, you know. And I will go back to him. And then Krokop, you go to Krokop, it's in Croatia, and there's ice and snow, and... There's bodies floating in the in the river, and he sits in front of the grave of his father from the war. And he do, I was like, whoa! I remember when he came up, he was he was crying. Krokop had tears in his eyes. He was standing and he was about to fight freaking Fedor, <laughs> and it he it, it got to him. It got emotional, you know, because he just yeah saw him sitting at the grave. But those packages, you know, they give you goosebumps. You know, people, I said, why can't they show this in uh, in America? But some I don't know what the reason was. They couldn't. That's what they said. It's always been said that in Pride, some of the matches were fixed. 
for example, Takata and Coleman. Is this something that you've seen and do you think this could have been true? Yeah, I, I, I think that because everybody knew about that. Um, it was so funny because we had to do, uh, we had to talk about it. And I look at Quadros and I go, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that, that fight. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then Quadros says, don't worry about it. I got it. You know, I'll talk about it. And as soon as it started, we're, we're live. He says, yeah. And then we had Coleman at the counter. He said, boss, take us through that fight. <laughs> and I'm, this is live. <laughs> and I go, no, no. You know, so he completely set me up. It was so funny because I was so against it. Um, before I found out that he was going to lose. Uh, that was the first game plan by, by heel hook in around five minutes or something. So when the press asked me who I thought was going to win, I said, Takata, five minutes with a heel hook. You know? <laughs> and of course, they didn't like this. I had to change the script. And that, you know, But I go, listen, man, once you make the mistake of starting to uh, sending faxes to gyms in where you ask that it has to be a fixed fight. You don't think that those those people they started sending these faxes to all the gyms. Look what Pride just sent to me. Everybody knew it, you know. And then I'm not allowed to say something. Come on, man! Everybody knew it. You were sending it out into the world. So, yeah. But th this, I have to say, I don't think I can see another one. I don't. Uh, I I can't think of another fight that I thought was a fix. That was the only thing I'm saying. I know Takara and Coleman. Maybe if they give me another name that I remember the fight, maybe that was as well. But I don't think it was what people thought it was. I don't think it was. I I don't think it happened more than. Well, I have to go with a big number five. That would be a big number. But I don't think we're even going to be there. So yeah, there were some in the beginning, but it was also with Takara. It was a pro wrestler, you know. It was not Sakuraba. Sakuraba was, you know, he's the man. Another bit of controversy that was always with the promotion was the fact that um, it was allegedly run by the Yakuza. Did you see any, um, any evidence that this could be the case? No, you hear all these stories, you know, but I never saw the evidence. I, I just, gracious people, great with us. I've never seen any violence, anything, intimidation, nothing. So, no, I, we only had good times there. So, yeah, I heard it, but I've never noticed it. Right. And uh, what do you think back then? It was a lot different than it is now. Uh, guys would fight multiple times in the same night. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's something that should be brought back? Or do you think that was just for pride and it should just stay in pride? Well, it, 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 it was kind of cool. But, you know, you have also luck, a lot of luck, right? If you, uh, uh, if you had two wars going into your final fight and the other guy had two knockouts in the first one minute, Guess who has the, the most chance of winning? The guy without the injuries, of course. He's going to have the worst. Uh, so I would always say that if, even if you win, you know, and it's close fight, they should do an immediate rematch, you know, so you can. So I always said that doing an eight-man tournament spread out over three shows is just the most honest way to go because then nobody has an injury. Nothing can happen, you know. Yeah, we always have injuries, but you know what I mean. You know, the... Everybody is the same. And that would, then you honestly would know who's the best fighter. Now, a tournament is cool, and you know who's the best fighter, but there's also luck involved in a tournament, always. So, you know, to cut the luck factor out, you know, spread it out over three days. So you don't, look at the UFC. They did it in the beginning. Well, pretty much everybody was, it was all tournaments. But, but Pankras had one. Uh, but that was two fights, I think, in one night. Yeah, one before and then two fights in one night. In 2007, when the UFC bought Pride, um, what was going through your head? I mean, since you were such a big part of it, was that kind of a sad moment for you, knowing that all that is coming to an end? Um, you know, I was already gone. I checked out there because they, uh, the, the producer I was talking about, I, I simply, I didn't want to, listen, I'm all about happy and having a good time, you know? And if I go to, and I get constantly backstabbed by a certain person, uh, or, or I see what he's doing to other people getting the fire because, of course, people like that, they don't have the cojones to do it to me. But, you know, you see how they do it to other people. I just didn't want to work. It's bad for my karma, you know. So, so I checked out. That was in 2005, I believe. And, uh, and then Morrow stayed. And then that guy suddenly became a VP or something, whatever it was. And that's immediately, Morrow said, oh, he's going to be that? Yeah, he says, okay, find a new commentator for me. I'm, uh, I'm out as well. So we just, we just went out at that moment. It's a shame because uh, it was such a big show. They never listened to me. 
they, I told them way many years before, I said, let me talk to the Athletic Commission in California. I have a good way with people and because it comes from an honest place, you know, and I, I, I really mean what I'm saying. I'm not lying. I'm not doing anything. And as long as you tell the truth and they can see you tell the truth, I think we have a chance to go to America. And they said, no, 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 no. For four years, they were blocked. And then finally, they said, okay, we'll let bus ride. They changed it on the day. They never did that before. I did my talk. He says, we're splitting hairs here. He says, okay, it's legal. But we didn't even have to wait. And I looked at him. I said, you should have done it way before because now already the UFC, the ultimate fighter was there, you know, and now it became a powerhouse. Now it was going to be, but before, Pride was bigger. It was much bigger. But they made so much money in Japan. As soon as Tokyo TV or whoever was pulled their, themselves out of it, that's when they wanted to go bigger and, and, and to America. But it was too late now. The UFC did way too good of a job by promoting their own organization. And, and you know, they did it perfect. Now, after your commentary, you've gone into acting. You've gone into movies. Uh, how exactly did you get into the Kevin James movie, the Here Comes the Boom? And did you get to offer any insight to make the movie as realistic as it could be? Listen, I know Kevin since 97. That's 23 years. I remember visiting him in his one-bedroom apartment that he shared with his brother. That was an overland uh, across the studios, Sony Studios. And it was the first season of The King of Queens. He found out that I was in America and immediately his management called me because he was a big fan and he always watched my fights for Pancras that they pay per view to America. Him and together with Joe Rogan, apparently. And, um, and then when he found out it was there, I got contacted and, you know, I met him and, and we just clicked immediately, you know, we became good friends. So over the years, I've been in pretty much everything. He always put something in there for me, you know, and when I, I, I'll never ask. I never ever ask for anything because I would, I, ooh, I, I see other guys do that, you know, you, they come and they visit one time, you know, you bring a fighter or something. Hey man, can you I go, oh, don't do that, man. Why would you, you know, just let it be, you know, if it comes, it comes, you know, let, let, let God take care of that. And, and fortunately for me, he, uh, you know, he put me in a whole bunch of stuff and that was, here comes a boom. And here comes a boom. Yeah, of course. I had some saying in there as well, but you know, uh, Mark Delagrada, uh, Delagrada, he did a v very nice job with him. I mean, when you see Kevin move on the focus mitts in the back uh, 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 locker room before the fight, which got the main event, so to say, which is actually the undercard fight, but people always say, oh, it's a championship. No, it was an undercard fight. You know, that's what it is. So, uh, yeah, he, he did a really good job. So when you see him there, people go like, whoa. That, that's really, is that sped up? No, it's not sped up. And you know what even funnier was? Because there's the last moment when he lifts off Christoph Szczynski and he slams him down and then he's out and he knocks him out and he wins the fight. When that happened, that scene, we had about 500 extras in there and, and they, got to bring a, they brought a crane in, you know, because they can control the falling down. But before they brought the crane in, he went to the center of the cage and he, uh, Kevin says, can I have everybody's attention, please? And everybody's looking. He said, Christoph, come here. Put me in an armbar. And Christoph puts him in an armbar. He lifts him up. He puts him down. He lifts him up. He puts him down. He lifts him up and he puts him down. He says, okay, everybody saw I can do this? Yeah. He says, okay, bring in the crane now. That's what he did. And I remember when we were watching the fight in the movie, there was this writer, she was next to me, a horrible person, like really nice in your face. And then later when you found out what they wrote, you know, people are so two-faced. It's really weird. And she said, yeah, right, when he lifted him up. I said, well, he actually asked the 500 extras. He did this three times in a row, for real. So and she was looking at me, oh, yeah, but I like the movie, like more. And then she, man, when I read her review, she went to town. Some people, huh? they, they have no sense of humor. I always say this with that movie. When you go to the watch a movie, you come out of a movie, do you feel happy? And people go, yeah, it's a freaking feel-good movie. Job well done. That's how I rate the movie. Not about dip, 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 dip. it's not possible that he fights and, you know, fights for a championship. I say, you're not following the story. It was an undercard, uh, undercard fight. You know, it's a last-minute replacement. You should even, and by the way, Brock Lesnar fought two fights and he became a UFC champion. Who was all very weird. He was also a wrestler before. So in real life, it actually happened what you're saying right now. So, yeah, that's just people. You know, they have the mind made up and then nothing can steer them away, I guess. In 2017, I was in Vegas for International Fight Week. And I think my favorite part of the week was the Legends panel. I got to see you, Big Nog, Tito Ortiz, and Don Fry. And Brian Stan hosted and was asked you questions. And I, I want to see if you remember one of your answers here. He asked you, 
If anyone who hasn't been in the UFC Hall of Fame yet, who would you say deserves to be in there the most? Do you remember who you said? Probably Kevin Randleman. It was Kevin Randleman. Yeah. And now when he got inducted this year, um, I know you were close with him. How did that make you feel? And how do you think that is just for the whole MMA community in general? It, you know, it made me feel super – but Kevin, uh, what people don't know, we, we, we became good friends, you know, and uh, – uh, he was just such a good guy. I mean, and it would help Benny so many people and what he did for kids and every, you know, he, he was such a good person. You know, you see the monster, you go like, what? He's crazy, but he's not. He's like the totally opposite of what you're seeing and uh, very approachable. So we also had a really great time with everything. So, yeah, that, that was hard. So, and, and when I found out, listen, he was, what did they say? They said in Ohio he was voted a uh, wrestler of the century, not of the decade the century i go for for a wrestler and that was i think it was before he passed away so it, it was not like they did an honor to him but that that says something about his skill set <laughs> you know if ohio state which have one of the best wrestling programs in the country you know if they say that about a person you know so yeah this the, it, it was a slap in the face it was really uh it was really hot i remember we, we we visited one time when he had that staph infection with the big hole in his chest and we were with a group of fighters in uh, in Vegas they say hey let's go to the hospital you know let's uh, score some points let's uh, you know make it fun you know so let him laugh so we went over there so and this is a guy you can't who can't die you know who pushed off a freaking truck off his body uh, with the engine pushed off, had a whole skull open and he just pushed the car up and then he walked out they go like you think this uh, indestructible and a freaking pneumonia who knew a pneumonia crazy huh that's crazy. So I know you have tons and tons of stories. And uh, I was told by a couple people now, if I ever get to talk to you, I need to bring up Don Fry. Apparently, you have a pretty good uh, Don Fry story from what I've heard. Oh, wow. Well, there's a bunch of Don Fry, man. He's the, he's the man. He's such a fun guy. Uh, well, I remember him and Dennis Holman going at it together. Uh it, it escalated really. <laughs> it escalated really fast. Like something started, and suddenly he said, "I'm going to rip your head up, and I'm going to do something." I'm not even going to repeat what he said. And I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" They went from zero to freaking 300 miles an hour. You know, like, and right away to get in the face. And I'm in the middle, and I'm pushing, I'm pushing Don back, and suddenly I felt like I got pushed because I lost my balance. So I pray my boss, who's freaking pushing push, push, push me? You know, you stay back, you stay back. And then Hansel Gracie was standing there and he said, boss, he just kicked you in the back of your head. You know, he <laughs> wanted to kick at Don Fry, but when I pushed him away, I was in the path and he just kicked me. I thought somebody pushed me because I lost my balance. I go, who's pushing me? You know, but apparently it was a, a penalty kick in my face from the back. So, yeah, that is, that is Don Fry, you know. You can go from zero to suddenly really high. But, you know, sweetheart of a guy. And what I like with him as well, he's black and white. There's no gray areas with Don. So that means if he doesn't like you, oh, he will let you know. <laughs> you know, he, he has no problem with that. He goes through life like that. Yeah, funny dude. Now let's go in and let's talk about a little bit more modern day MMA. Um, the sport has definitely evolved a lot since you started and it is now. You have more fights. I mean, you have fights almost every weekend now. You have multiple promotions. The talent seems like they're better. I mean, they're at a very high class talent right now. What do you think is the result for all this? Great. I mean, finally we see people who make it into a profession, you know, so who, uh, who don't run out of gas. I was getting so aggravated at in the time when I was finding people running out of gas. I go, dude, that's like being a painter and bringing a half a can of paint. It's like the dumbest thing there is. It's your job. Go run some hills. It's very simple to get stamina. You know, just push yourself. You know, I couldn't stand it. Oh, yeah, but he's a heavyweight. This shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. They got bigger lungs. They got everything. So don't worry about it. So now, and then in the beginning, you saw the strikers who never wanted to learn the ground, who never wanted to learn, and constantly lost by, by submission, by submission, you know. Thankfully, I was one of the first guys who said, you know what, I'm going to learn to get really good on the ground. We didn't have any wrestling in school, maybe like three gyms, but not close to where I live. I said, I'm just going to go re be good on the ground and good on the feet. So if they take me down, you know, then I can go for submission. Actually, it was a cool, because I have like 42 submissions with the pancreas, with the rules that it was. 
but it says in the UFC Hall of Fame stats, it said, I never attempted a single takedown. So that was kind of cool that I still submitted all these people, but I never took anybody down, anybody down because my, my wrestling always sucked. And I'm the first guy who says that, you know, I was not great at takedown defense. So I just realized I better be good on the ground and reversals and submissions, you know, so that if you do, they do take me down, I have actually more submission victories than I have knockouts now. So I came out as a much better fighter. Now, that was then. Now everybody... Great wrestling, great striking, great ground, great stamina. Everything is a, is a science. The weight classes are perfect because all that BS in the beginning, that's only good for a certain amount of time. Once people, if you're same level, same skill, and one is uh, 100 pounds heavier than you, 50 pounds heavier, guess who's going to win? You know, yeah, the little one might get lucky, maybe a little faster there, but weight and power on the ground and reach, all that stuff, it's going to work against you. You know, eventually, if everybody's the same level, then weight is going to win. It's the same as everybody's the same level. The guy with the most stamina is going to win. You know, there's always something like that. So I, I was a big uh, supporter of the weight class. I wish that would have happened when I was competing. Although, you know, I was always around that sweet spot. 205, you know, it's not too heavy, not too light. So that, uh, yeah, I could fight pretty much everybody. You know, it seems that back in the day, Fighters would only train during their training camp. They weren't really fighters whole 12 months out of the year. And now you have guys like a guy like Colby Covington who's come out and said, to be a professional fighter, to be at a championship level, you need to train to be a fighter 365 days around. Do you think that is something that uh, is true? And do you think that is something that a lot of guys are now doing and that's why we're seeing the talent level increase? Yeah, it's 100%. You know, if you just always at 80%, you know, and then if something in last minute, and if you're a fighter, you're stupid not to do it, especially if it's a big event coming, you know, main event, and it's your weight class, dude, get ready, because you never know, if somebody drops out, they might give it to you, if you call, hey, hey, I'm uh, freaking in shape, you see, so being at 80%, so you know, the last 20%, you can do that in weeks, you know, the real push, so to say, so no, I'm 100% with him, that's the same as what any other profession you would do. You know, you're also always straight. I'm pretty much all the soccer guys, even out of season, they practice every single day. You know, and look at the Phelps. He swam every single day, never took a break. Because his coach would say, in a year, you have 50 more workouts than all the other people have. Because you went on a Sunday, you just kept going, you know. It's, it's a thought behind it. Also, what I was talking about it yesterday. They were talking about uh, sparring. And then I, it was so weird to me because I was with big name guys in, in, in MMA. And they would tell that they would spar 80% on, uh, on Fridays. And I go, N? And he go, what N? I say, what do you do the other day? She don't spar? And he goes, no, only on Fridays we go 80%. So I start laughing. He goes, what do you do? I say, we spar twice a day. <laughs> Every day. We do the whole workout. We, we always wrap up with sparring because that's what you're going to do. You know, you have to type, you sharpen your... I never got that, that people... Just train one time a week and they go 80%. Well, you don't want to train with us, man. Because we'll, I will not try to knock you out to the head. But your body, oh, yeah, I'll go for it. And they, they better do it to me as well. Also, the kicks to the legs, we'll go hard. The hat, of course, we watch out. We don't want to knock each other out because we're all fighters and we want to have a career and talk to our families. <laughs> all right, last question for you here, boss. So there's some great fighters. There's some great talent currently in the game. Who are some fighters that you have, I guess, on your big watch list right now? Guys that you think um, are going to be stars of the game for a while to come and just guys you enjoy watching? You know, so uh, many. Uh, so who know? I think uh, it's, uh, hopefully they get him back, you know, if they're going to offer him some money. But I like TJ Dillashaw, the way he moves. Like Dominic Cruz, the way he moves. Uh, Israel and Asanya. And Asanya. Uh, that far coming over Paulo, that's going to be a freaking crazy. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Max Holloway, I'm a big fan of Max Holloway. Just the way he fights, you know, he can be five rounds ahead and then he still rolls the dice at the end, you know, when he drew that line in the sand and he says, okay, let's brawl it out. You know, he didn't need to do that. He was way ahead, you know, but he li liked to take that risk. You know, that's, that showed, I wouldn't do that as a fighter. He does it. You see, that's why I look up to that because that's, that's some cojones. I wouldn't take the risk. I mean, I'm five rounds ahead. Why would I take the risk? So, uh, yeah, but I, I really i am impressed by people like that who don't care, who just keep on fighting. I'm impressed by fighters who do not become a champion, but who are just a nightmare to deal with. You know, the fighter that you, as a champion, somebody tells you, oh, you're going to face so-and-so next month? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, you, you know you're going to be in the fight. You know you're going to probably win, 
but it's always dangerous against a guy like that. And you have a bunch of guys that's so much harder. They keep on pushing. You know, that's why I tell people always, they always focus so much on, on belts and on, 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 and I said, don't, you know, being that guy, can you imagine that the fighters talk about you like that? Like, oh, you fight him? Oh, good luck with that. You know, that's a, that's a big compliment, you know. It's better than some other fighters who've been a champion for a while and who just won by decision, uh, you know, not really going in for the kill. Chuck Liddell, always loved Chuck. Yeah, he got knocked out a bunch of times. But you know what? He still comes and he brings it. It's a fight, you know. And I respect people like that. He just... Swings for defenses, doesn't want to change his technique. That's him. That's what the people fell in love with. Let's fight it. Love a guy like that. What do you think of Amanda Nunes? Is do you think she's going to be a problem for a while? Like it doesn't seem like she's going to be losing anytime soon here. Yeah, I I have this uh, every I, I thought the same thing with uh, Anthony Perez. I mean, as you know, you see sort of fighting going like, okay, it's always going to be this guy now. You know, but it's somehow everybody comes. Then again, Nunes is a different animal. So her first fight was a strike force. I was sponsoring her. She had the boss with the logo on her, uh, on her shorts because I saw her training. Somebody sent me a video and she said, you want to sponsor her? I go, oh, like, yeah, I want to sponsor her. Because she looks such an animal at that time already. There's all the way to back. So at the sea of flourish and, and now being the champion and then even made, made a big growth spurt. I mean, cyborg. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, the way she dismantled Rosie and everybody. I mean, the power is just insane. And she's funny. You know, she's a great role model. I, uh, yeah, I think she's hilarious and she's funny and, and cute. She's everything. She's got the whole package. All right, well, boss, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for talking with me. You're very welcome, brother.